So when Kennedy says this happened and this happened, and I'm like, yeah, actually, he's right. And enough people, okay, so how about we listen to him since he's running for president? <laughs> and we go, okay, these are the parts he's right, these are the parts he's wrong, and here's why he's wrong, and so on. And just put, so, yeah, okay, so he might be right, he might be partially right. Even if he's 100% wrong, a lot of people think what he thinks. So, how strong is your position to counter what he thinks because other people believe it right. if you don't listen to him? Welcome to Conversations with me, Peter Bogosian. Today, I'm excited to have Dr. Michael Shermer on the show. He's the founding publisher of Skeptic Magazine and the host of the podcast, The Michael Shermer Show. Michael was a monthly columnist for Scientific American for 18 years. He's the author of several books, including the New York Times bestsellers, Why People Believe Weird Things, and The Believing Brain, both of which were instrumental in my intellectual development. His latest book is Conspiracy, Why the Rational Believe the Irrational. We talked about the substitution hypothesis, aliens, and the efficacy of debate. It's a wide-ranging conversation, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Michael Shermer, it's a pleasure. <laughs> Good to see you again, Pete. Good to see you again. Yeah. Yeah, um, you've come a long way since full, yeah. met you at Portland State. I know. What a hellhole. <laughs> uh, and my full, full disclosure for everybody, I, I consider you a good friend. I, I hope there's some reciprocity in that. And um, There is, indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> but to watch you make the transition from you know lecturing as a college professor to public intellectual activist. That's right. A, it's a different vibe. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. And you came to my class and you lectured in my class and... Uh, that was great. See, at the time, atheism was a kind of a hot topic. Right. And the whole politics, woke, progressive, and all that right. stuff was not was just not quite taken off yet. So it's it's almost feels like, well, the atheism thing is old now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now we have these new battles. Yeah, and so that's one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about. I wanted to talk to you about a few things today. So I interviewed Richard, uh, Richard Dawkins, and... So, so I'll even take a step back. So I've been using these conversations to kind of help clarify my own thinking about things and talking to people I respect. So I have some questions about things I've been thinking about that I'd like to ask you about. So the substitution hypothesis, the idea that as the old religion dies, a new one comes in, mm. as Christianity mm. dies, now we're dealing with wokeism. Uh, before I tell you what Richard said about that, what do you think about that? Do you think, because you, you've written extensively that the, the, the brain is an engine of belief. I think I got that line from your books, right? The brain is an engine for belief, and belief is just the default state. And so the, the brain is the hardware and the software is what comes into it. Do you think there's any truth to the idea that, for example, once wokeism dies, some other derangement syndrome or some other mass delusion or something else will come in. Do you think there's any truth to the substitution hypothesis? Something hypothesis? like that, but uh, that's probably a proxy for something deeper going on. Um, it's, it, it'd be like if we talked about the human sexual drive, and that's why we have to have Playboy clubs. If it's not Playboy clubs, it's something else. It's not the clubs. Those are just secondary things. It's, you know, it's the deep human sexual drive, something like that. So do we have a religious impulse? Well, we have something deeper, like a, a need to socialize with other people that think like us or believe similar things that have to do with something transcendent or larger yeah. than ourselves. Right. And that can be fulfilled in many ways. Religion is one way, meditation and or, you know, transhumanism or whatever your thing is. And so that th those get filled in. And in this case, you have a, a secondary or a, a second deep um, human nature impulse, which is moralization. That is, we have a sense of right and wrong, and we feel energized and motivated to do something about wrongs and injustices that we see. Everybody does. That's normal. That's why we have self-help justice. If the police system breaks down, the court criminal justice system breaks down, people will just take the law into their own hands because everybody wants the right thing to be done and injustices to be corrected. So if you marry those two, then you have, you know, religion as one institution that has this kind of higher power, deeper uh, goals that we're energized to be part of that other people in our tribe also believe and a moralization component, like yeah. there are right and wrong, there's good and evil, and we should fight against the evil and reward the, the good and so on. So in a way, 
I think social justice movement, Black Lives Matter, uh, Me Too, the, the BLM, LGBTQ, whatever. These are all manifestations of this deeper, these deeper impulses, I think. And so, you know, we had the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, the gay rights movement, animal rights movements, and so on. And so this latest, this latest one is just another one of these uh, driven by these deeper impulses. So I, I, don't, I don't think it, 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 it's that when one dies, the other replaces. I think, just think there's multiple options on the table that they rise or fall due to other factors. So you don't accept the basic premise of the substitution hypothesis? No, I think, I think it's probably something deeper going on than, than just that. That, that, that one replaces the other because there's too many kinds of social institutions that people belong to. So, so let me ask a question. So I've been thinking about this for a long time. In skepticism way back when we, skepticism and atheism were the canaries in the coal mine. One of the things that we saw was initially people freaking out about lack of females at conferences, lack of women at conferences. And we saw a craziness take over that, an anger, a, a kind of vituperation that I hadn't seen before. I remember you sent me an email once, um, or maybe you said this to me on the phone, and I just thought this was so interesting, the thing that you said to me. All the people you've debated, all, and then I want to talk about the Joe, Joe Rogan debate thing at some point. All the people you've debated, and they have been numerous about numerous things. UFOs, which I want to talk to you about. We got a lot to talk about. And you have debated a lot of people. You've um, put some skin in the game, if you will. As a, you use that um, phrase in your podcast with Avi Loeb. I never miss any of your podcasts, <laughs> by the way. You put some skin in the game. I can't, I have so much on my mind, I can't even, I can't even remember where I was going with this. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, then I, I, fell, I fell down a rabbit hole into my own brain. Well, I think just back to the substitution hypothesis. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, we, we don't want to uh, make the mistake of thinking something that's uh, uh, huge on our horizon and it looks big, you know, like the whole woke, progressive, trans, LGBTQ. We hear about it all the time. Most Americans are not on board with this. Right. If you look at the polls, Gallup and Pew, and they ask people about this. It's only like seven and a half percent of Americans think, yeah, this is a good idea. Yeah, eight, so eight you're percent. talking about, you know, over 90 percent of Americans think, no, this is this has gone too far. Yeah. Right? So we don't want to say that replaced religion because it hasn't. But, you know, religion is still oh, okay. uh, quite active. OK, so this is this is where I was going. I got my, my thought. I rerun my brain. So here's what I don't understand. So in the skeptic and atheist movement, a kind of new religion grew from within that movement, the, the wokeism, the critical social justice. Here's what I'm trying to figure out. Bracketing the substitution hypothesis for a moment, why is it that some people seem immune to these ideas, to like whatever's morally fashionable? Like why is it that some people are just not susceptible? And I'm I have two things going on in my brain. I'm trying to say this without being self-aggrandizing or arrogant, and I'm trying to say this without f flattering you because I don't mean I don't mean it that way. Like, why is it that you, for example, have not succumbed to this alien craze, or that you haven't succumbed to this wokeism? Some of its age, you know. I'm 68. I'm a baby boomer. Most of the wokeism stuff is a Gen Z, you know, people born after 1996. Um, and we know there's huge generational differences on trends like this, what, what's fashionable, what people want to get into. And this is definitely a Gen Z or a late millennial movement. You could track it from when it started, say 2014, 2015, when it migrated into college campuses. This is about when uh, Gen Zers started to go to college. Uh, and it continues now. It can't just be age, though. It's not just age. No, there's multiple factors. You know, also politics. Again, most, you know, half of Americans are conservative. Yeah. Right. Seventy-five million people voted for Trump, as he reminds us constantly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, it can't be that uh, you know everybody has fallen for this crazy woke cult or whatever. They haven't. Most people haven't. I mean, half the country thinks anything liberal is crazy. 
And then within liberalism, you know, anybody like who's, let's say, Gen X or older thinks most of this has gone too far. So we're really talking about a, a, a not very big movement that's actually very vocal and gets a lot of media right. attention. So it feels like it's this huge thing. You know, the world's ending. And uh, you, know, you hear this on conservative circles all the time on Fox News. And so, you know, oh, my God, this is happening and they're tearing America apart. We're about to collapse. No, we're not. <laughs> you know, there's some exaggeration there. So is it is it so you're saying there's a suite of factors like age, politics, um, politics, but even conservatives are affected by wokeism, even religions are affected by. Yeah. So, you know, atheism went through several movements in the 90s. It wasn't very big at all. And it's the culture wars weren't focused on science and religion until late 90s. And then Richard's book came out in 2006, The God Delusion, that kind of launched, oh my God, the atheism movement's going to get huge. Mm. And then very quickly, within months, there was a, a cut between the militant atheists and the more conciliatory atheists, right. you know, Hitch and Dawkins, and you, you got to get in there and be a bulldog and rip these idiots apart, you know, and then everybody else is like, well, no, we, don't, you know, we, we should be nice about it. And, uh, and, and then there was another cut around 2009, uh, of the atheist plus right. plus being social justice then that made it purely political a, a, a schism in which that was really a kind of woke movement back yes. then yes that was the earliest stage of that woke movement yeah yeah but actually some of that you can see earlier threads in humanism because when i you know kind of came of age in the 70s and 80s it's like well okay i'm no longer religious you know i was a evangelical christian for seven years Pepperdine. I'm not doing that now. So what's my worldview? Well, science. Yeah, but science is kind of a more of a method. What's my worldview of what I do believe? Because atheism isn't a worldview at all. It's just, I just don't believe in God. There's not, well, what do you believe in? Okay. Well, so humanism, you know, universal human rights, for example, is something that we're positively in support of. But then, but when I joined these humanist groups, they had like the, the little boxes you tick. You know, these are the things we believe. Yeah, yeah. And they were mostly liberal political positions. It's yeah, like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. what if I'm on board with half, but not the other half? Or yeah. with 12, 10 of the 12 boxes I tick, am I a humanist? And so then it became very restrictive uh, there. And I thought, oh, this is a big mistake. You know, that we should be a big tent that everybody can join. Liberals, Demo Democrats, Republicans, anybody. And uh, but I think this actually happens back to the larger picture to yeah. all social movements. You know, are you a pure uh, Marxist? Are you a Leninist Marxist, a Stalinist Marxist, a Trotskyist? You think it's a necessary condition of uh, movement? Uh, for, I think it happens. I don't know if, how necessary it is, but yeah. most movements seem to go through these splintering. Feminism, you know, who's the true feminism? Th this is why we have third wave feminism and Correct. apparently fourth wave feminism. Right. Because why? They don't agree about what's the right feminism. Even Ayn Rand's libertarianism or her objectivism went through this purging where right down to what books you read, what movies you like to go to, what cigarette brands you smoke. I mean, really bad stuff. And if you if you're not ticking all the boxes, you're out. And it's like, this is insane. I've been observing this for so long. And, uh, you know, so I, I think there's just something about social groups within the groups, egos fighting for money, status. I don't know what, but they. I don't think so. So you don't, or do you think? Does does disposition? So skepticism to me is not a set of tools that one uses to analyze. There's not merely. It's a disposition. It can be. That's part of it. Some people are naturally more skeptical, and some are more open to new ideas that are. Because you, I mean, your work. One of the things that you've turned me on to in your work is that. You can have, have the tools, but if you have the tools and don't have the attitude, you'll actually dig yourself deeper into delusion. Yes, that could happen, right? Right. So the, right. the idea is that you want to have that. That's why it, it, one of the most important things that I constantly talk about is belief revision. So the, the tools, having the tools without the disposition is actually worse than not having the tools at all. Because that's why people believe weird things. They dig themselves down. So one thing we try to do is to teach uh, what the cognitive biases are and watch out for them and you. But there's one more cognitive bias that is the, the bias bias. That is, it's hard to see it in yourself. You can train people to recognize it, and they're good at that with a little training of your you know, the confirmation bias, the hindsight bias, and the my side bias, and so on, in other people. 
So then you got to take it another step. Well, don't forget you might, our group okay. might be subject to that. So you have to train that and that's really hard. Okay. So uh, I, so my question to you is, if someone doesn't naturally have these dispositions, what's the best way to get them? Well, your book, you know, how to have difficult conversations, I think uh, has a lot of tools there. Um, it, you know, so it's not just the facts, but the way the facts are presented in a manner that doesn't threaten the identity of the person that you're trying to get them to change their beliefs. So the examples I give, if, you know, if you're a Christian conservative and you think creationism is what they're supposed to believe, and you tell them, no, evolution is true, and by the way, you have to be an atheist to believe that, they're not going to ever accept anything you say about that because that would mean giving up their deepest religious identity, and that's not going to happen. So you have to just take that off the table. You know, you can keep your religion, whatever. We're just talking about genetics or evolution or whatever. Uh, and so the same thing would be with climate change. You know, that got uh, bundled with Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth film, and he was vice president of the Democratic administration, so he's a liberal. So climate change got bundled with liberalism. So automatically, when a conservative hears climate change, their brain auto-corrects to, oh, anti-capitalism, anti-American, right. right. anti-jobs. You know, it's like, okay. Can we put these, can we help, so I don't want to say put the dispositions in people. Can we help people nurture these dispositions in early education, from literature, film? I talked to Andrew Doyle a little bit about that. He's fantastic, by the way. I know. Yeah, I know your show with him was great. Um, can can we use the existing educational infrastructure to help nudge people towards these dispositions? I don't know, Pete. The way it's structured now, I think we need massive educational reform. Uh, the old model of the teacher standing up in front of the blackboard and the students in rows, uh, it's effective for some things, but the round table seminar discussion, debate, open, your method, Socratic method, your street epistemology, just doing that in the classroom. I would like to see students offered the kind of thing I teach, skepticism 101, how to think like a scientist, or Pinker's rationality, or logic, reasoning, whatever the tools are, at a much earlier age. You know, we have this method, you know, okay, so you got to take, uh, you know, ge uh, geometry and then pre-algebra and algebra and then pre-calculus and calculus and all that, all that's fine if you're going into engineering or one of the STEM fields that uses those tools. But most people don't. 99% of the people who go through middle school and high school never use those tools. How about, you know, how statistics and probabilities uh, explains most of what happens in the world? You know, uh, uh, you know, that's why I use uh, Leonard Melendez's book, The Drunkard's Walk, where he talks about, you know, the regression to the mean, the law of large numbers, how most of what we see happening in the world is explained by statistics and probabilities, randomness. And people just do not grasp this right. at all because they've never heard it. Right. You know, so or, or and while I'm at it, <laughs> about a course in basic economics, you know, how does the stock market work? What, what is money anyway? How do you, and how can I get more of it? Yeah, I read a, like a that. while ago. In fact, I think it was in the 90s. I read Paulus's book, Mathematical and Numeracy. It's oh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Like really, yeah. for me, that was it. A game-changing book to help clarify my thinking. But so back to this idea that I'm going to ask you what pedagogies you think we should be experimenting with in schools. You gave us some ways or heuristics or even ways to think about that financial education money the socratic method would be a pedagogy bayesian reasoning basic you know just get off of black and white binary thinking that's right and wrong true and false and just think of everything as some degree of probability more or less then you can get people away from the you know i it's either absolutely true or absolutely false and since you think differently from me you have to be wrong right Okay. Uh, not merely wrong, but an existential threat. Yeah, that's right. Morally wrong. Evil, right? Yeah, that's why we use the Likert scale when we do the street yes, epistemology. I like how you do that, yeah. Yeah, it's good because people might be willing to move from here to here, but if you go, no, you got to go all the way over there. They're not going over there in one step. Yeah, right. Um, We talked about the substitution hypothesis. We talked about Bayesian reasoning. And I have to talk to you about aliens. Aliens, yes. Well, let's use, let's use Bayesian reasoning, well, right? Well, okay. So, before we even yeah. use Bayesian reasoning, um, before we go down there, I had Schellenberger on. He talked about I me. Mean, the reason we're talking about this is when Reed and I go around the world, I'm telling you this as a fact. 
and Reed can attest to this, every single place we go, we let people choose any topics they want. There has not been a single time, not one time anywhere in the world we've gone where people have not wanted to talk about aliens. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yes. So now Bayesian reasoning. Well, it's why a would hot you topic. Not, well, first of all, it is a hot topic because first of all, it's in the news a lot with the UAPs and the government programs and whistleblowers and all that stuff. Okay, let's see what they got. Uh, but I think it's, I think what you're experiencing there is something like back to the uh, replacement hypothesis of, of, uh, uh, of a religious like impulse to think that there's somebody else out there that knows we're here and they have come here. Right. I mean, most people that are enthused about UFOs and aliens have zero interest in the SETI program which is a rigorous scientific uh, program to uh, use radio telescopes to try to pick up signals from other civilizations. And they've had zero success so far. And they have a whole set of criteria. This is what's going to count as a signal. That's not a rotating black hole or whatever. It's sending out a sequence of, let's say, prime numbers like Sagan used in yeah. contact. There's Jody Foster with the cans on. All of a sudden, the prime numbers start coming through. Well, that can't be a rotating black hole or, or whatever. Uh, so that must be a sign of intelligence. No, the, the UFO community has zero interest in that. So that tells us something. This is a different group of people. They're using a different epistemology um, where anecdotes, stories, the credibility and credentials of the eyewitness, all of that matters. In the SETI scientific community, none of that matters. Just show us the evidence and we'll believe otherwise we're skeptical, but to the UFO community, all that stuff matters. Yeah, it sounds like religious reasoning. I think it is. It is a little bit like that, right? You know, who was it that saw the miracle? You know, uh, oh, he's a sheriff. You know, oh, the, the mayor. Oh, in, the, in that case, what, what difference does it make what their position, what their job is? <laughs> right. And uh, yeah, so in fact, I saw Mark Kelly, the the pilot ast astronaut right. twin. I posted this on Twitter. His little uh, video clip of him talking to NASA a NASA meeting. And somebody asked about the, you know, the credibility of the eyewitnesses of these pilots that saw these things. And he says, let me tell you about, about eyewitnesses. I'm a trained pilot and astronaut. And, you know, we see stuff all the time that turns out to be nothing that we thought it was. And he gave the example of being in the space shuttle, uh, in the, with the cargo bay open because they were releasing something. And, uh, and his fellow astronauts thought, oh, my God, there's a tool or some kind of um, object in the bay that they were looking at. And it's like, oh my God, how big is it? Is it moving? We better do something about this thing. And he t said, they turns out it was the space station, International Space Station that was 80 miles away. Oh, wow. And it's like, and he says, I've known pilots that try to uh, like uh, rendezvous with a fellow pilot and it turns out it's a buoy on the ocean. So you can't really use can't trust Bayesian them. reasoning with that. Well, hang on. You can't trust the anecdotal storytelling credentials of eyewitnesses because we're all susceptible to illusions, biases, and so on. The Bayesian reasoning part comes, I use this, again, people are black and white. So you're saying alien, you know 100% aliens have not come here. No. You're saying alien, there's no one else in the universe, we're alone? No. 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 You know, that's, that's their, they're out there somewhere. Right, right. It's a different question from are they yeah, here? Yeah, right. right? Right. So people get confused about this. So if I say, okay, let's just shift it to this. You know, right, right. You never, this is called Cromwell's rule and Bayesian reasoning. Oliver Cromwell, uh, you know, me thinks in the bowels of Christ, you might be mistaken. Just think you might be mistaken. Right. So is, are there aliens out there? I don't know. You don't know. No one knows for sure. They might be. Let's just assign a low probability. And if new evidence comes in, we'll raise our uh, estimates of the probability of that being true. Have they come here? I don't know. Probably not, but maybe. <laughs> Show me your evidence and I'll believe you. Crazy I'll give it a 1% or a 10%. And <laughs> yeah. so like recently somebody said, oh, Shermer, you, you gave this, this Grush, David Grush yes, a hard time. Exactly. And then now you've changed your tune on Twitter. It's like I, I changed my tune because I talked to Michael Schellenberger. I was just going to talk me, to you about that. And he told me he talked to what eyewitnesses to confirm what Grush said about his eyewitnesses. So then I go, okay, all right. You're, so I'll, the Bayesian... Prob so, the probability yeah, so you have your priors. Your priors are, this is what I, I believe at the moment when I start believing this thing. And then you update your priors based on new information that comes in. It's like, oh, okay, well, then maybe, that, maybe that's true. You know, we have, now we have two, and then Marco Rubio comes. Well, I've talked to people, too. Oh, okay, there's a third one. Now, it's still not evidence. I can't say I know for sure that aliens have visited here. 
but it means that the eyewitnesses that the one guy said, which was, you know, okay, maybe, maybe not. And then two guys like, huh, okay. And three guys, you know, it's like, if you hear, if you hear this at the door, you think, like, oh, what was that? If you hear, you think, like, I wonder if somebody's at the door, somebody's at the door, right? Three data points tips us into very probable. Again, you don't have to assign 100% or 0%, just something in between. Then people don't have to get so emotionally charged. Like you're saying 100%, no, I'm not saying 100%, could be in between. Okay, so one of the things, I love that question that you asked Schellenberger. It's not, hey, has Reed seen the aliens over there? No, it's like, have you seen the craft? Have you talked to anybody who's actually seen the craft as opposed to, yeah, there's a secret program over there and people have told me they've seen the craft. So yeah. when Schellenberger said yes, I was like, holy moly. Like that's another level. Now, how, my next question is how do you actually know that they're craft? Well, okay, so then that's a separate question. So, so first we have to establish, you know, can you, can you trust Michael Schellenberger, Marco Rubio? Or I think David the answer Trump? to Schellenberger is yes. Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah, 100%. Okay, so I trust what he says. Now, what does he say? He says he talked to people who said, okay, who are these people? I don't know, because he, he won't He's say. He's protecting his sources. All right, okay, so that, you know, it's like, all right, I understand about privacy and classified. But Grush classified. has a top secret security clearance. All the I people- I don't know how top it is, but he has some security clearance, yeah. Okay. And the people Schellenberger talked to also apparently, and same thing with Ruby. Okay, so, but what is it that they, okay, let's, let's, assume that those three people accurately reported what they were told. Okay, what were they told? Who are these people? We don't know. What did they see? Well, they said, we saw a, something. We saw a craft. Okay, a craft. Well, we make craft. <laughs> you know, if you were in the 1950s and you saw the SR-71 Blackbird flying by, you knew nothing about it, or the stealth bomber, you know, it's like, wow, I just saw this incredible craft. Yeah, we made that. You know, it could be something like that. It could be you know, well, back engineering, it could be a crashed Soviet satellite, and we are back engineering their technology to see what they're doing, because we do this, absolutely. Okay, so the leap to me, and the thing with Bayesianism is it's always hard to figure out those priors because you don't want biases to affect those. But it seems to me, uh, I mean, I would be, I know, Obviously, I have no security clearance, but I would be flabbergasted if the United States did not have some secret programs with some hangers in some bases. Yes. We must have that. We do have that. Okay, so, <laughs> so, okay, so that's- but for what reason? Well, that's the question. Yeah. So, so the leap to me seems to go from, I've seen this and it's alien. Like that's, that's, a, that's, that's the that's largest amazing. leap. Yes. Yes. In that whole yeah, this whole business calculus. of you know we have off-world technology. How do you know? How do you know it's off-world? I mean, was there some test done on the materials? Yes, there was these tests with the ratios and the isotope. Yeah, but there, I saw nothing that was said there that would uh, preclude it being some CIA experiment or DARPA. DARPA does the craziest research. Right. The stuff we know about, you know, ninety-nine percent of it is just completely batshit crazy, including a bat bomb. <laughs> where they, they had this idea of capturing bats and then strapping a little bomb to the back yeah. and then releasing them. This was, yeah. I think, during the Korean War. Uh, might have been Vietnam. Anyway, it's like, what are you talking about? The bomb weighs more than the bat. Yeah, you know, yeah, to, yeah. But So they just spitball ideas like crazy. Yeah. And then they start developing, building stuff to see what works. So who knows? Somebody saw something like that and went, oh, my God, I've never seen anything like that. That's off world. Okay. So I, what I wanted to do this before this interview, but I couldn't do this. So I just had to, I couldn't ask someone, um, Ilya Shapiro is a buddy of mine. I was going to ask him, he's a constitutional lawyer. So I started Googling around, go Googling this. So you can, t I'm not a lawyer. You can take this for, for whatever <laughs> it's worth. Let's say that we really wanted to figure out if this were true. From my understanding, the way that we could do this literally overnight is the Senate intelligence committee could fly down to Roswell and get a hotel and they have my understanding, and again, I'm not a lawyer, is they have access to everything. There's not, they can I just. I don't think that's even that's true. I don't think Marco Rubio could fly to Area 51 and say, take me in the back. I want to see everything. I don't think they'd let him. I mean, you have to have security, really, really special security clearance to get into Area 51. The Senate, and I think most Senate senators, tell you. I, I, don't, I don't know for sure, but I doubt it. Right. So, so that would be the ultimate test. 
But okay, so here's the problem. What if Marco Rubio gets into Area 51, or whatever, and comes back and says, well, I didn't see anything. Well, you know what the ufologists are going to say? Well, of course they hit it. Well, the whole idea is he would, you, he, okay. So then, then it's another Bayesian calculus. Like how, how likely is that? So he doesn't tell anybody he's going down. He and whoever else goes there first thing in the morning. He demands a complete lockdown. I mean, you could think through ways where we could do this. Complete lockdown of facility. Everybody is to sit on their bottom and put their hands on their head. If anybody caught will be, I don't know if he could have the authority. They'll be, they'll be charged with a felony or whatever. I don't know what a military tribunal, I don't know what it would be, but it would seem that there would be ways of figuring this out within the pre-existing legal infrastructure. Uh, uh, if they found positive evidence and Rubio came out and said, all right, I've blown the whistle off the whole thing. We've had this program since the 1950s. Here's what we found. And then everybody go, finally, disclosure. But what if he came out and said, no, nah, I, uh, to be honest, it was just experimental aircraft that DARPA was working on. There's no aliens. Do you think the UFO community would be satisfied with that? No. no, they would say he was lied to or he's lying. It's part of the cover up. Yeah, they're going to kill him unless he says otherwise. <laughs> yeah. Right. During the, um, the, the big uh, uh, invasion of Iraq, when uh, W said, you know, they have weapons of mass destruction right. they're going in there. And the UN inspectors went in there. And you know, six months later, they come out and they go, you know what? He doesn't have any weapons of mass destruction. Bush's initial, the administration's initial response was, that's because they moved them. Right. That's how we know they have them because we couldn't find any. It's like, right. wait a minute. So, so the lack of evidence means it's true. Right. Right. It's, it's like that credo, credo absurdum. The, you know, the fact that there's no evidence for God means that there really is a God. Like, wait, what? <laughs> right. So the only way we could really get at it is with, in the positive way. You can't prove a negative. It's just, uh, and you just, you're just hand waving with conspiracy theories about the cover up and so on. That's not going to get us anywhere. So then we have to shift back to this Bayesian probability with the principle of proportionality, as, as David Hume first articulated it, or the ECRI principle. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, ECRI. And there, um, you correctly identified the leap from interesting uh, secret technology for spying on the Russians or whatever to aliens is huge. Yeah. That's a huge leap. I mean, everybody agrees on all sides. The discovery of extraterrestrial intelligence would be one of the top discoveries of all time. Since fire is what I tweeted. <laughs> yeah, I put it up there with the resurrection of Jesus. It's, you know, just billions to one. Yeah, okay. But, but, okay, it's not zero. Could it right. right, it's not zero. So, uh, so, but we have to have some commensurate evidence to, to take us up to that level. You know, well, I'll go we, with you we, to the secret spy balloons. Well, we have planes. to have some co evidence to take us up to a maybe. Yes. Right? The default right. is not maybe. Right. The default right. is extraordinarily unlikely right that's right so it perfectly said yeah that's right wouldn't the wouldn't the question in that instance be a, a defeasibility or a disconfirmation question to people who espouse these beliefs under what conditions well here i would employ your strategy yes. of asking yeah, yeah, what yeah. would it take to change your mind yeah what would it take to change your mind under what conditions yeah. and then you would see so if it doesn't have to be Marco Rubio. Ideally, it would be, uh, Schellenberger uh, said, I think he said this on your podcast and he told me this, this is the only, this is the most bipartisan thing he, he's come across, basically. Everybody wants to yeah, know what's yeah, true. Yeah. Come there's, on, let's do it. There, there's nobody who's, you know, right. there's no con right wing, con there's no, we don't want anybody to know. Everybody wants to know about this. Okay, so in an ideal world, it would be someone on the left and someone on the right and someone as you said, some with no wings, not right wing, not left wing, <laughs> and they all go in there together. And if that's not enough, and the very idea that someone could say, well, they move them and then they have to do mental gymnastics. Well, they have faster than light travel. How do you think they got here? You know, they, they FTL out, whatever it is. So in that, in those cases, you're correct. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't think anybody's mind is going to change, but I think it would shift the Overton window in terms of how people view the credibility of what they're seeing. Like, I think someone with no dog in the fight would then look and say, oh, come on. Now, like, I listened to, and I thought it was really, really good on your podcast that you gave it to Avi Loeb about Oumuamua. Like, he was making claims beyond the warrant of the evidence. Yes. And I'm no expert in this UFOlogy, and I'm certainly not a Harvard physicist. 
but he was making claims beyond the warrant of the evidence. He was, because, and I know because before I recorded that with Avi, I talked to some astrophysicists uh, who told me, who knew all about him, Omo, they read the papers, they know Avi, and so on. Oh, he's a very respectable scientist, yes, but he's just he's going beyond the warrant of the evidence, and uh, we most of us don't believe it. Yeah, I talked to Brian Keating about that too. Oh yeah, Brian, um, yeah, he's good. Brian's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, yeah, he's good. He, he's a, he's a just a, like what's the evidence? I think likeliest what's going to happen is if there's secrets being kept, it's not because they're covering up aliens. It's that they're probably doing stuff that they've always done, spying on the Russians and the Chinese, developing spy technology, stealth aircraft, whatever. Okay. And we're not going to tell the public about this because we don't want the enemy okay, to know. Okay, but that's the thing that I don't understand. Like, that's, like, if you legit, I mean, okay, this is, we both agree this is just... There is no adjective to describe how monumental this would be. I mean, this would be literally sense fire. This would be so <laughs> yeah. epic doesn't even begin to explain how huge this would be. Why wouldn't you get the whole Caltech, MIT, every, why wouldn't you just make a Manhattan Project? For, I mean, this, none of this makes any sense. There's like, oh, we want to keep it. To no, that's insane. Like, it doesn't even on the face of it make any sense. It, it, it's a little bit like the JFK assassination documents that they slowly release some of Freedom of Information Act. Finally, now we have most of them. And most of the revelations about it have nothing to do with the CIA or the FBI or Johnson as being involved in assassination. It was, you know, secret Cold War covert activities of spying on other foreign leaders, other countries, rigging elections, uh, uh, working with people to assassinate foreign leaders, overturn regimes we don't like. I mean, we were doing all that. I mean, the right. CIA was involved right. in, you know, third world countries where there were, um, you know, kind of a failed state. So you have the communist dictator and the fascist dictator and American business interests in those countries. Well, well, the fascist dictator is going to be friendlier to yeah, yeah, yeah. American business interests than the communists. He'll just nationalize the company and take it. So we're going to support the fascist guy. Now, we don't like fascism, but, you know, he's a son of a bitch, but he's our son, son of a son bitch, of a right? Bitch, yeah. yeah. So... That was going on. We know that now. Yeah. Uh, our Project MK Ultra, you know, secret mind control experiments. We didn't find out until much later. Uh, uh, Cointel Pro, FBI spying on Martin Luther King Jr. Hence your book, Conspiracy. Yeah. 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 So we know about that. So if there's more that we don't know about, it's probably in that big bin yeah. of, you know, this is what secret uh, intelligent agencies do. Yeah. Not the little bin over here. It's aliens. Okay. So two things. One, I am amazed at how many legitimately smart people have fallen for this. Like people I know, people I, I'm, I'm amazed by that. Um, but I want to show you, Reed, let's pull up a clip from Michael. Uh, was this in, where is this, Australia? Okay, this is at Speaker's Corner in, a, in London. Okay, so just take a look oh, yeah. at this video. Oh, okay, here we go. Is this you guys? Oh yeah, okay, here we go. <laughs> it's a little silly, but let's take a look at it because these are ordinary people. There are no actors, just random people who participated. Wow. Okay. Tell him why you agree that aliens are visiting Earth. Nice and loud so he can hear. Because whenever there's nuclear activity, the aliens get in there and they stop it because they know that we're stupid. We are like fish in an aquarium. They put us here and they're watching us and we're just too stupid. That's why they don't show themselves to us. It's like the fish have nothing to do with us. They, they know that they're laugh. there. Yeah. And like we know we're here, but aliens are just on another <laughs> level. But they watch over us. Thank you. Tell her why you strongly disagree with that. You told me something that you could have made up. There is no evidence for that. <laughs> There's no evidence against it. There's more evidence <laughs> for it because yeah. the Earth is tens of millions of years old. Oh. And how can we be the only form of life there you in See? this whole of you, the universe of anything? If you have a look it, in the star in the sky, the there questions. are more stars, stars yeah. than sand grains on the beaches of the whole Earth. Okay. Yeah, that's great. That's great. That's a, that's such a good example of, you know, confusing. Are they out there somewhere? Have they Exactly what questions? you just said, right? Yeah. And also the nuclear thing, that's interesting because um, 
they're just talking about this um, uh, nuclear site back in the 70s where there was some weird funky lights in the sky and there was some electrical problems in the technology system of the launching of the rockets and so on. Uh, but this is the only time this has happened or one of the few times. There's a few other sites where there's some weird lights uh, and so they immediately leap to the aliens are upset about us having nuclear weapons like it's a clip from the Day of the Earth Stood Still, the 1951 film about the aliens coming to warn us about nuclear weapons, right? But they're neglecting the base rate. How, how often does this happen? Uh, how many nuclear bases are there? Well, a lot. We have land-based missiles. We have submarine-based missiles. We have bomber-based missiles. That's the tr nuclear triad. How come the aliens aren't buzzing around the submarines uh, and so on? Because, you know, that would just be, that would be just as bad. And how many um, other sites have had lights around them that are not nuclear? So you have to look at the counterfactuals. What compared to what? What does that mean? I have one anecdote. This is a problem with anecdotal thinking. Compared to what? How unusual is that? Okay, so I just want to be crystal clear about one thing because when I was very involved in the skeptical movement, I remember people would say to me, "You just don't want it to be true." So let me be let me be totally clear with you right now. I genuinely hope, <laughs> like I really truly hope we have the wreckage of down crap like from the bottom of my heart yeah, me too with oh that's where i was yeah, going so yeah. you hope it too of course, so yeah. it's like you're not it's not that you don't want it to be true it's that you think that the priors the reasoning the evidence isn't sufficient so now here's the question that i have for you just as for the ufo people under what conditions would you be willing to change your mind i have for michael Shermer. Under what conditions would you be willing to change? What would you have to see to make you say, holy shit, like I was wrong, I made a mistake, I'm sorry, we have downed alien craft, we have been visited from people by, you know, people, quote unquote, aliens since whenever, Roswell, whatever. What, what would it take for you to change your mind? <laughs> Somebody asked that on Twitter the other day. Oh, it was Brian Keating, yeah. actually. What would you put on the cover of Skeptic if it turned out, you know, this was, I, I, I would put, we were wrong. Yeah. Because, you know. All right, what would it take? Well, all right. So, I was wrong would be even better, right? Michael Shermer was well, wrong. Well, yeah, was but wrong. it's not just me. I yeah, mean, yeah. there's a whole community of skeptics. So uh, actually, most scientists are skeptics because most ideas in science are wrong also. Mm. Um, so what would it take? Okay, the Chinese spy balloon is a nice model. When that story first broke, it's like, what? Are you sure they're seeing what they think they're seeing? This thing was way far away, yeah. and the pictures weren't very good. And then in the coming days, it's like the thing started getting, it went over Canada and through the northern part of the United States and everybody and their brothers out there with their cameras. And then it was slightly better photographs. And it's like, yeah, okay, this definitely doesn't look like an illusion or anything. And then we sent up one of our fighters and there's a crystal clear, you know, high resolution photograph with the equipment hanging from the, it's like, okay, that's definitely a identified aerial phenomenon, not unidentified, no yeah. question about 100%. You know, the Pentagon, the president, everybody, Secretary of State, yes, this thing is there, and we're going to shoot it down, and we're pissed off at the Chinese. The Chinese are going, hey, it's not ours, or oops, it's ours, and it accidentally went off course for the fourth time. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, okay. So, And it's in all the newspapers. It's covered on the Daily News. No one asks, what's the credentials of the pilot who took that picture? You know, is he, is he decorated? How's his eyesight? How trustworthy is that? No one cares about that because there's the picture. We can all see it. So if that happened, everybody would believe, including skeptics, absolutely. Sure. So what is the that in that sense? That, it, it, okay, so here's it for my, my little bet, my $1,000 bet that no one will take me up on, uh, is that you know by January 1st, 2024, the President of the United States, the Pentagon, Secretary of State, and other world leaders will all announce we have made contact with ETs, and here, here's the evidence. Here's the photos. Here's the debris. Here's the hangar where we keep it. Okay, so and then that would, it. That so, would do it. So d debris would do it for you. Physical evidence. Physical. Kind of evidence. So physical evidence. So not what are the, the Tic Tac video. I, mean, not I, those I personally videos. have never seen the Chinese spy balloon with yeah. my own eyes, but I, I trust that you know a thousand news stories with videos and pictures are trustworthy and is not a conspiracy cover up like the moon okay. landing. So I, I, just, I just want to be clear. What it would take for you to change your mind that the United States has been in contact. <laughs> this is such an yeah, insane I conversation. Know. Yeah, I know. Sorry. <laughs> we got to do it. it is, but it's, it's, everybody loves it. So yeah. here so, we go. Yeah, and, and, and again, the, the, given how many people believe this, it's what we need to talk about, especially yeah. with you, yeah. right? So for you to to change your mind, you would need 
and I don't want to put words in your mouth, I'm trying to figure this out, not merely video testimony, but the records of Downcraft. Yeah, some physical evidence, right. Okay, but how would you know that that evidence was actually alien? Well, okay, so th there we would then need several layers of, well, you know, scientists from these different universities examined the material and determined it was not of this earth and so on. Not just one person, but, you know, labs from all over the world. Uh, Non-terrestrial origin. In the same way that, you know, if you're a biologist and you, and you want to name a, a new species and you show up at the conference, yeah, and they go, hey, I, I have a big announcement. I found a, a, a second bipedal primate. It's still extant on Earth now. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Show us. Well, I, I don't have the body, actually, because it ran off. But, but, you know, it was 3 in the morning. I was asleep in my tent, and I heard this noise, and I snapped this picture real quick. And if, if you kind of use your imagination and squint, you can sort of see the shadow. It looks like how far is he going to get with a, a, a room full of biologists? Nowhere. I mean, it's like, come on, dude. Come back next year with the actual body. Right. And then we'll believe. Right? Yeah, like Bigfoot. I'm that way with Bigfoot. That, 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 that's the analogy. Yeah, yeah for sure. So the same thing with aliens. Just show me the body. Okay. So just, just to be me, us. just to be clear, you said something that you're willing to put up a thousand dollars of your own money. Yes, I did. This so, right. yeah. so could you please what what is your bet with people? So the bet is you put up a thousand, I put up a thousand, we'll put it in a third party account. And that put a definite date on it. So I, the date I put was January 1st, 2024. I'm willing to extend it to another year or two if they want. Uh, and that the criteria is the equivalent of the Chinese spy balloon. You know, just the Secretary of State, the President, the Pentagon, all state, yes, we have made contact <laughs> for sure, 100%. It's covered on the evening. It's not just one news station that gets the exclusive and no one covers it. I mean, just the whole, you know, uh, David Grush story. And yeah. it, oh, it's huge. How come this was not even mentioned? Uh, by ABC News, CBS News, NBC conspiracy. News. Conspiracy. <laughs> it's a conspiracy because they have fact checkers and they have they have screeners. They go, you know what? This is too speculative for us. We got to cover the real story. Oh, okay, so now I have two questions. So, is it correct that nobody's taking you up in that bet? That's right. And and it, it, but it's it's not some kind of gotcha bet. I'm not just making shit up here. This is there's a whole industry of the betting, the prediction markets, money markets, but uh, not money markets of of uh not fine. yeah uh but but prediction markets. long like, bets yeah yeah so and, and these have a, a long history of being more accurate on let's say political elections than polls do so if you actually have to put skin in the game you put your own money in and i'm gonna bet that trump beats hillary and the odds you know and the odds makers set it up you know it's three to one again so you put up a thousand if trump wins you win three thousand and so on. This is all done. This is a whole industry of the so, so no, markets. And no, they're pretty accurate. Nobody's take. Okay. Two, yeah, no two one will questions. take me up. They won't even respond to me when I. Okay. If <laughs> nobody's taking you up on it, to me, that tells me they don't believe it. Or at least they're not very confident. Yeah. Or, or that the, they, they, they're genuine conspiracy theorists. They think that the conspiracy is so deep that, we'll never you know, find out, Biden's maybe. a lizard man or yeah, something yeah. insane. It, it could be that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think they have the courage of their convictions. They go on Twitter and go, disclosure is coming any day. Absolutely, 100%. Yeah, I hear coming. that all the yeah, time. Right. The resurrection is like, okay, the, the, so, uh, the second coming is coming any, any minute any, now. Any minute now, right? So, okay, how about we put a date on it? Oh, no, no, no. I'm not going to put a date on it. No. Okay, so I know someone's going to listen to this and they say, well, if Shermer is so confident, so I've just had a go at the people who wouldn't take your bet. But if Shermer is so confident, why is it only a thousand? Well, I didn't want to make it like you know the million dollar challenge, and no one would do it for financial yeah, okay. reasons. Okay. Uh, okay. It's just it's, it's it's a modest amount. It's not a thousand dollars. I'm, I'm willing to lose a thousand bucks to find out that there are aliens. God, wouldn't that be great? I hope you lose. <laughs> I love me too. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. I know. But again, I'm pretty confident that if we find anything, that if Freedom of Information Act or congressional investigations turn up anything, it'll just be more stuff we were doing during the Cold War, or even now. And it's just like the WikiLeaks. Uh, you know, here you have millions of classified documents that were pretty damning of the U.S. government. Same thing with the Pentagon Papers. You know, they were lying about this, that, and the other. We were spying on Angela Merkel, yeah, there were yeah. cell phone calls, we were doing this, we were doing that. Very embarrassing for the State Department. Nothing in there about aliens. 9-11 <laughs> is an inside job. Right, right. Nothing like that. The moon landing was fake. Nothing. Right. So, you know, and again, the Afghanistan papers that revealed, you know, the, what was really going on in the Afghanistan were very, very damning to the U.S. government, the Pentagon, the U.S. military. 
nothing about, you know, and by the way, they got uh, aliens, <laughs> nothing. So if there was a cover up and it, uh, there'd have to be some kind of paper trail somewhere. Yeah. Because you can't keep everybody's shut up. Not everybody in the world signs an NDA and, and, right, and, right. You know, and so on. And even an NDA with something like aliens, I mean, that's just... <laughs> No, that's, I mean, people sign NDAs all the time and then and then blow right through them. Yeah, and then <laughs> and that's not even remotely like an NDA for an, an alien invasion or something crazy. Okay, so I'm going to talk real quick about. I want to segue that into. You're on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. Um, it, Musk took over Twitter. My account exploded after he took over uh, Twitter. Uh, Jack said that he wasn't shadow banning people, which was. Technically, I suppose true. He was de-boosting people. Was he used another word? Yeah. Um, and th we can bracket that. But Twitter wants to put, you know, this is mis misinformation, and uh, certain uh, the BBC wants to have like you know a disinfor a misinformation uh, alert or what have you. Uh, so I wanted to ask you uh, about. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what do you who think decides about, that? Yeah. What do you think about that? I, I'm not crazy about it because who decides it? I mean. Elon's pro free speech, but the moment he goes down that pathway, then you have to set up some kind of committee and then you have the algorithms because how many people would you have to hire to monitor however many tweets there are per second, you know, a million per second or something? How are you going to monitor that? So you'd have to have computers doing it. And then yeah, community notes they have. Um, so it's interesting. I, I, as a rule, I don't talk about covid thing because i don't think anybody should listen to me because i have literally no expertise in any domain that would be even remotely applicable to that with that said uh you know matt ridley and others were talking about the lab leak hypothesis that was labeled a conspiracy theory everybody Crazy. jumped on that that was labeled disinformation misinformation um and I do think it's important when you move in the public space that you say what you're wrong about things. So I want to say what some, some things I was wrong about. I was wrong about the Hunter Biden laptop. Um, I genuinely believed, uh, and I would have assigned an extremely high uh, likelihood that this was true, that it was Russian disinformation. I saw the letter signed by, mm. you, you know, this is before the legitimacy crisis was hitting home in our institutions, CIA, FBI. I'm like, okay, well, you know, um, that was the first thing, by the way, the first moment after I realized, oh, my God, maybe there is a deep state. Like, maybe there really well, is there a, kind a, of is, a political... Well, there kind of is. Yeah, like... <laughs> it's not quite as deep as, uh, as the conspiracy theorists make it out to be. But again, we know from, um, from disclosures of what the CIA and FBI were doing over the last half century that there's a lot of stuff that none of the public knows about. Not, not only that, Congress doesn't know about it. You know, most of those revelations, you know, like the church committee and uh, right. you know, they revealed a lot of the papers around the Kennedy assassination it had nothing to do with the CIA, FBI involved in Kennedy assassination. Oswald acted alone. That's what everybody says. Yeah. So there are but, conspiracies. But there, was, there are conspiracies. Yeah. So, uh, but other things that that uh, that our government and, and intelligence agencies do that they don't want our enemies to know about. Therefore, they keep them secret. I get that. <laughs> I'm a big pro free speech advocate, so let Twitter just you know, people post whatever they want. But obviously, there's edge cases. You know, you can't have some ex CIA guy or the Secret Service or whatever. I I'm going to post on Twitter the nuclear codes <laughs> to our missiles. We can't do that, right? Or the edge case. You know, ISIS recruiting people on Facebook. Okay, yeah, you have some restrictions, but the moment you go, well, you know, if like here's my analogy, you know, Holocaust denial should be banned, and it is. It's illegal in in lot, quite a few countries, not here, but even in Canada, it's considered hate speech, and you can go to jail by saying, you know, I don't think six million Jews died. All right, w w what if I'm in the middle of the debate about how many Native Americans died due to European colonialism? You know, well, how many here were here pre-Columbus? Uh, you know, is it was it 90 million, 50 million, 10 million? You know, there's debates about this. We don't know. There's no accounting. There's no sense, census. Right. So and and how many of them died by disease versus extermination yeah. or war and conflict and so on. And there's debates about that. So what if I side on the low end? I think it was only 10 million, not 100 million that were here when Columbus came here. And I think only maybe half of them died due to violence and the, and the rest is disease, something like that. Am I a denier? Am I a Holocaust denier? Mm. People, we got to have let people have their say, even the crazies. Even the people that are just bad intentioned, 
you have to let them have their say so that the rest of them, that might be right. You know, like the lab leak hypothesis, I never understood why that had to be censored. It was never even a conspiracy theory that the Chinese did this on purpose. It was only that it was an accident and there was something to do with gain of function research, which is done, and it just something went wrong. Why is that? Why is that a problem to talk about? And now it looks like that probably is what happened. Yeah, and, and it went from a consp not only a conspiracy, but a racist conspiracy hmm. to what people accept. You know, I wanted to uh, use that to talk about uh, Rogan's invitation with $100,000 oh, yes. <laughs> to the charity of his church. What's that guy's name? Peter Hotek or Hotez. something? Hotez. Uh, to debate Kennedy and you... You RFK, and you've put th things out uh, on on Twitter about you think that Kennedy made false claims, but I want to bracket whether the claims are true or not, and I want to talk about that idea because I have, I'm pretty sure, so I have a strong opinion about this, but I want to get yours, and then I'll tell you what mine is. Do you think Hotez should have accepted that debate offer. I do. I, I, I mean, first of all, the, 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 the ante is now up to two, over $2 million. Holy shit. Yeah, is bunch, it really? A bunch of rich people jumped in and said, I'll put in a hundred thousand and then pretty soon. Holy shit. Yeah, I did not like, know that. Yeah, it's like 2.1 or $2.6 million to the charity of his choice. How about you take the, you go on Rogan, debate Kennedy, and then put $2.6 million into vaccines that you're, that you work on producing. Why not do that? Or give it to the Gates found or you know, to mosquito nets, whatever is your thing. Uh, I, I, my guess is the reason he doesn't want to do it, uh, it, it, because I have done this many, many times is because it's a lot of work and it's not enough to know a lot about vaccines, Absolutely. which he does. You have to know what is this guy going to argue? What is his points? And you got to go through them one by one. Like Kennedy will come up with, well, Joe. Let me tell you about this study that was done back in 1991, published in this particular journal that okay. found this thing here. Now, of okay, course, but you do it. Yeah, yeah. You do it. I know, I know. Uh, uh, but again, it's a lot of work, and he could be made to look bad if Kennedy comes up with something he doesn't know about. Like, again, a obscure journal article published back in 1976 that showed autism linked to blah, 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 and he's like, uh, I don't know that study. Well, if you knew that study, then you'd, you'd see I'm right. Okay, so what is This that, is the risk. What does it say about the state of trust in science as an institution if... Well, it's not good for the public. Uh, the, you know, they see Correct. that happen and they go, you know what? What is this? What's this guy's problem? Correct. Not only what's his problem, but maybe RFK is onto the truth. Yeah. Maybe. maybe and then maybe there's this, there really is this vast conspiracy. I didn't know it was up to two million. I thought it was a hundred thousand. Um, but, you know, why wouldn't he do this? So here's my take on it. If he were just a normal everyday scientist who had no Twitter account, who never went on Rogan, who had no social media profile, who didn't move in the public space, who kept to himself, I, he probably shouldn't do it, right? I mean, that would be up to him. Yeah, the idea That would be up to him. But I mean, he's the, already in I the know, public space. I know. He already went on Rogan. He's already has. He's already participating in public life. And people see him not doing that. And, and, and I think then the conspiracy theorists really go crazy. But one of the things that was so disturbing to me about this was that you said that he should debate, and correct me if I, I don't, if my, the chronology, I completely agree with you given the fact that he already participated in public life. And then you and Tom Nichols had what I considered to be a very reasonable disagreement, and then he blocked you. Yeah, weird. Like that was crazy to yeah, me. Yeah. <laughs> they unblocked me. It's like, okay, whatever. Okay, dude. <laughs> so, so I don't know if you want to go, go down the details of this, but like, you mean to tell me, I mean, he was on your show. You've read his stuff. I quote his book all the time. I thought it was really good. I think we do death of expertise. I think we do need experts in the society. I think that that's one of the reasons I'm so bothered by the crisis of legitimacy in our institutions. And there was something, I don't know if it was like a 2023 moment or something with like, he's caught in the orbit of critical social justice where you don't debate or you don't talk to people or it's not that Michael Schirmer's wrong, he's an enemy. He's a, I don't know what it was, but I was so disappointed that he blocked you. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Well, maybe it's Twitter that uh, it drives people crazy. I don't know, makes them very polarized. I'm not sure. I mean, part of the problem 
uh, again, I mean, you, you identified it perfectly. If, if it was a nobody that doesn't do debates, is not in the public, then he has a lot to lose by going on Rogan. Yeah. But this guy, he should be able to do this. And if he considers himself a public servant, like my job is to get out there and, OK, well, this guy who's running for president again, how can you platform RFK Jr.? How can you? Pla he has a platform. Yeah, over a million Twitter followers. <laughs> yeah. He's, not only does he have a platform, he is. I don't know if he'll actually debate Biden because the DNC, but he is the most likely if there is somebody who's going to, uh, uh, um, I don't want, how do I challenge Biden would be a polite way to say it. It would be RFK. And he's, pop, he's actually, oddly enough, he's extremely popular among uh, um, many left-leaning Republicans, many soft, yes, quote, quote yes. soft yes, Republicans. Yes, I noticed that. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah, the last poll I saw was uh, like 20% of Democrats right. now support him. So it's not just that he's, he's not a nobody. He's, it's not only that it's not a nobody, but he moves in the political space. Right. So it would seem it would be even more incumbent upon someone else who already moved in the public space. Right. And right. for you to point that something like that out, and then for someone to say to you, well, you know, basically... Right. right. Uh, for someone to say that to you and then the consequences to block you, to me, that says far more about them. Now, to his credit, he unblocked you, but I think it's part of the craziness that we're experiencing now. Right. Yeah. So um, there's one. Yes, of, that's, a, that's a problem. So right. could we apply John, uh, John Stuart Mill's pro speech trident argument to this? You know, 100 percent wrong, partially true, 100 percent true. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, OK, let's go through those. Uh, what's what's wrong with listening to RFK Jr.? Uh, I mean, we should listen to him. Why? Well, first of all, he might be uh, he might be right about some things, and listening to him for with, with Rogan three hours, you get a, a lot of stuff, right? So when he talks about the regulatory capture by big pharma and big tobacco and stuff, I know enough about that to know that's actually true. I have a whole section in my conspiracy book on. Um, the capturing of the regulatory state by big tobacco through Naomi Oreskes uh, book, Merchants of Doubt, and how they apply oh, the same. Great. Yeah, yeah. They apply the same methods to uh, casting doubt on climate change, and it's like, yeah, that's actually true. That actually happened. Or big pharma, you know, kind of cheating the regulatory system to get uh, drugs through. Like this is why we have an opioid crisis because they lie to the public and to doctors saying, we have clinical evidence, here's our data showing that these drugs are not addictive. They were lying. So when Kennedy says this happened and this happened, and I'm like, yeah, actually he's right. And enough people, okay, so how about we listen to him since he's running for president and we go, okay, these are the parts he's right, these are the parts he's wrong and here's why he's wrong and so on. And just, put, so yeah, okay, so he might be right, he might be partially right, even if he's 100% wrong. A lot of people think what he thinks. So how strong is your position to counter what he thinks because other people believe it right. if you don't listen to him? Right. So one of the things that you did, and I speak about this, is you went to, was it Treblinka, the concentration camp, and the claim from the Holocaust deniers was, why is there, among among the claims, was why is there no lock on the door? Oh, yeah, that was at Matthausen. Yeah, the lock on the, <laughs> I'm sorry, the door Matt doesn't lock it. Uh, on yeah, the gas so, tube. yeah, so you went. And you, and I think this is an example, less of debate, but when someone makes a claim, when someone else answers that claim, it doesn't fester. Right. Right. So the back, this used to be called a backfire effect, the belief that just talking about it will backfire on right. you and the pe people will believe it even more, the falsehood. But in fact, th those studies didn't replicate. Right. And it looks like now that people do change their minds. So let me, let's, let's ch change to this. So, um, that those I mean, Neiman and Rifle or something that that that, that study was very influ influential in my work, and it was very influential for why when I have conversations with people across divides, I don't invoke any evidence because of the backfire effect. But if you look at this at the studies in which those uh, to see if you can replicate it, I have a problem with those studies, and that is, I think that the backfire effect is still operative depending upon the moral valence of the claim. Mm, yeah, that, that the stronger yeah. the moral claim, the more likely it is. So I, and again, I have no evidence. I only have a, a truly a, 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 um, mountain of anecdotal evidence for this. But strong moral claims elicit a backlash when providing evidence. So I question the fact. Yeah, I, I question. That's a testable hypothesis. Yeah. But totally. That should be done, yeah. 
could be. Again, back to, uh, to my previous example of, you know, if you're challenging somebody with some facts, but also challenging their core beliefs correct that, by which they identify themselves this is my religion this is my political party identity level salience moral concerns yeah that's 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 a, that's a great way to put it yeah that's right and therefore and there you have to do an end run around that and say we're not talking about that just take that off the table you keep all that i just want to talk about this one little fact right here just you know co2 emissions or whatever it is and uh you know here's the studies and so on and just just focus on that so let me ask you, if I may, a personal question. Are you homeschooling your son? No, <laughs> Montessori. Okay, they have a constructivist pedagogy, but at that age, I think it's work. it works. It's not epistemological constructivism. It's like, you know, nurture their interest. and, and... Uh, It's very hands-on. Yeah. Uh, Maria Montessori developed some, I think, very effective ways of teaching math and reading, uh, counting, you know, one, ten, one hundred, one thousand, you know, the ten thousand block and so on, these little beads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I've walked it through it with him. It's like, oh, this is really good. And, and okay. learning to read. I've been you know, he's only seven. He's just doing it now. And it's it's pretty effective. Also, there's no uh, you know, a classroom with rows of desks that right, like, right, like there's right. little Prussian soldiers. Like yeah. the educational system was developed to make good little soldiers, good little workers. It's not like that at all. And, and, you know, he's a little guy with high energy. You can't sit, make him sit down like that. So they do a lot of running around. I think, I think what you're getting at, how about when he's in middle school or whatever? That's where I'm you know, going the, all the, even in Santa Barbara, the schools, the woke stuff is That's everywhere. That's exactly right. So my wife and I, she went to an all girls Catholic school in Cologne, Germany. And we were thinking, even though we're both atheists, we'd rather have a Catholic school for our little guy than one of these crazy woke schools where he's told he's not a boy, he's a girl or whatever craziness will be going on. I am hopeful if you want to get to the, you know, have we hit the turning point on this yet? That now that Bud Light and Nike and all that stuff with the uh, uh, with uh, Dylan Mulvaney and all that. Uh, it could be that is now not going to be in vogue for young people anymore. It's like, oh, corporate America has gotten behind this. That's not the cool thing to be anymore. Mm. So if the social contagion hypothesis is true, that most of this is being driven. I'm by, completely convinced it, it's true. Yeah, it could be that now that's not the socially cool thing to do. So it's going to be something else. And then this will die down. The only, you know, I mean, I don't care what people do with tattoos or dye their hair, change their hairstyles. You know, I'm a boomer. We rejected our parents values and so on. that's fine but uh, it's the permanent change irreparable damage irreparable damage yeah, you just they're not so, okay so let me know, let me ask not in a position so let me ask you a question about that the older i get um be 57 next month the more i think it's oh, in, to be 50 something again ah, to be 50 something. <laughs> you young men <laughs> that feeling my age all the time man. um uh, the, so the older I get, the more I realize we have to start making compromises with our fellow citizens. So here's my my take on the trans thing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, under no circumstances should anybody under the age of eighteen be uh, uh, allowed to medically transition. No Lupin, n- none of that. However, people have to have some dominion over their own body. They need some kind of sovereignty. What do you think about the idea, and I've gotten a lot of heat from people on the left about, because I don't personally think it's a left wing or right wing issue, but uh, I've gotten a lot of people, for lack of a better word, who participate in critical social justice, who are adamant that children believe they're born, you need to listen to their self experiences, etc. And then for people on the right that say it should be 25, your brain isn't fully developed to 25. Where, where are you on that? Well, I already draw the line, yeah. So I, I think there's a different phenomenon. So gender dysphoria, which affects very young children from an early age who identify as the other sex. You know, these are like tomboys, uh, girls that are tomboys that like to play with trucks and cars and yeah, yeah. run around and r- rough and tumble play and so on. And there's boys that are more feminine. Okay, and so the gender dysphoria is sort of extreme version of that. Then there's this new thing, rapid onset gender dysphoria, which seems to happen later in teens as kids become go through puberty, start puberty. Their bodies are changing. They're uncomfortable with this. They're anxious. Depression, all the hormones, you know, causes all sorts of things. And um, the 
first category of gender dysphoria looks to be, you know, just vanishingly small, just like 0.01%, not even that, uh, just like one out of 200,000 people, very, very small. This is huge. I mean, as we've seen, it's like a 5,000% spike in people who self-identify as the other sex or no sex at all or whatever. That appears to be social contagion. All the evidence is that's a social contagion because it's not happening in other age cohorts. If it was just that society is more liberal and, and so there's more freedom to come out, that was, it, that's the claim. It should happen in the other age cohorts, you know, not just 13 to 17, but 18 to 22 and 23 to 28 and so on, all the other age cohorts. And it's not happening in any of those. So um, there are people, I know trans that, you know, who, who tell me that, you know, they never felt comfortable with it. They, they, they you know, one guy, to, you know, a woman now said, I just could not stand that I had a penis. I just did not want this. I felt like an alien part. I just, it's not who I am and had it cut off. And, you know, that happens. And I, you know, we should show sympathy for these people. They really are experiencing something. This has nothing to do with the rapid onset gender dysphoria. This is the original gender dysphoria. So I think if we separate that, that we can use evidence to talk about different things. Then, you know, in terms of where to draw the line, well, yeah. we, already, we already deal with these issues. What's the right age for drinking uh, alcohol? You know, 21, 18. How about voting? You know, 18. Alcohol, 21. How about getting a driver's license? You know, used to when I was, you know, 14 and 15, I think I got my driver's license. Now it's older, 16, I guess. And I mean, you have to draw a line somewhere. You know, this is how the law works. Biology doesn't work that way. Some people could drive when they're 12. So others. what's your line? Uh, for the trans thing, I would say adulthood, generally 18. That's mine. Yeah. That's mine as well. And then, um, you know, before that, okay, so the argument is that, but if you don't let them do it early and they go through puberty, it's too late. That's right. Well, yeah, but you know, th th could you know somebody could say, well, I identify as being able to drive at twelve, and but we have to draw the line somewhere so we have laws. Um, I suppose there could be some edge cases where, with parental consent and the doctors are all you know, and there's been many many years of checking and so on. Maybe don't even know. you know, but there's always a risk of that going too far. Yeah, you know where the parents are super woke and they're getting virtue signals by saying my child is the other sex and we're on board with their transitioning and they make the decision. This could all be settled, Pete, very soon if there's lawsuits. So uh, as of, you uh, of, as you know better than anybody, our brains are not wired for double blind peer review testimony. <laughs> our brains are uh, or peer review. Our brains are wired for testimony. Uh, there's a great book. Don't sleep. There are snakes. Um, you, have <laughs> you read that title. one? No, I, no, no, no. It's about these, book, these missionaries. I like the title. <laughs> yeah, uh, about these missionaries who, who or this missionary who goes into proselytize to a tribe who's never uh, um, been. Uh, nobody could penetrate their language, but they they only communicated basically. You know, do you know Jesus? Do you know someone who knows Jesus? Is it like so? So the testimony was there. Um, uh, privileged epistemology. Uh, so you had Helen Joyce on your show. Uh, so I'm going to show a clip here. We have a clip queued up, Reed. Yeah, just get his take on this. Sounds... I'd, like to, I'd like your take on this, because this was, to me, so interesting. I read and I heard Jason D. Hill, the philosopher, said that the actual instance of trans is 0.06. I mean, I don't believe there's any actual instance of trans. I don't believe it's that kind of thing. It's a culture-bound syndrome. You think the whole thing is a no, not the in not no, like no. I I I believe the whole thing is a culture bound syndrome. Oh my God, really? Yeah, yeah, completely, completely. Because there, are, what does it mean to say that a man can really be a woman in fucking Samoa? So you don't believe that there's anybody like Buck Angel or any of these people who literally have something in their brain? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. If Buck Angel had lived in a different society, in what sense could Buck Angel have ever got the idea into Buck Angel's head that they were meant to be a man or were really a man? <laughs> that's really funny. Okay, that. See, yeah, what, what's your take on that? I, I, okay, I guess it depends on what it, what it is the it we're talking about. I mean, a, a, a man can't become a, a a male can't become a female, and vice versa. It's not possible to literally reprogram your entire body, every cell in your body, all your genes, your gonads. You start producing. You're a man, and all of a sudden, you can start producing eggs because you took test you, you took androgen or whatever, that will never happen. So technically, if that's what she means, then yeah, of course, there's no such thing. I think what's actually happening though is there are other factors, hormonal factors probably in the womb, in the utero changes that are different. And from an early age, 
again, I mentioned this, that, you know, these tomboys. Um, and maybe what she means there is that those are just tomboys and maybe they grow out of it. Maybe they become lesbians. No, no. She, uh, but, she means, so my interpretation, this is why it blew my mind. Like there's, the whole thing is a culture bond syndrome. Yeah. Like all of it. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know about that. Um, I don't know. Okay. So would there be, <laughs> then the question is, would there be a way to test that? Is there a test for that? I guess it would come down to really the biological measures you're using to determine or the psychological measures of tests that are given at an early age or something like that. Yeah, so that's what, a good question. I'm not sure. Yeah, well, like, what would that be hypothesis. a good test? But, but it just, it never occurred to me. And I, I told a friend of mine, uh, I asked a friend of mine who's a professor who has a PhD in anthropology. I'm like, all of this is this? Like, like literally all of it? And this individual said to me, well, if you think gender is a construct, then wouldn't it naturally follow that it was? Yeah, except it's not just a construct. It's mm. also very much grounded in biology. Or else why would the transitioners need to transition physically? Mm. If it's nothing to do with biology, why do you have to get breast implants to feel more female? Why do you want to wear a dress? Why do you want to grow your hair long? You know, these secondary sex characteristics are part of the gender identity, and those are biologically driven. Mm. So there's, <laughs> it's such a mixed thing, and we're in the yeah. middle of this. Part of the problem, we did a whole issue on, uh, of Skeptic on trans. There's not much data on most of these issues. I mean, just, I mean, how many detransitioners are there? I don't know. Nobody knows. Well, we have lots of anecdotes. There are reasons for, for people. There are reasons for that. But yeah. yeah. Well, in part because um, it's so new. It's just starting to happen. I Maybe mean, people just started the transition a few years ago, so they're just starting to detransition now. Could be most of them detransition. Could be almost none of them. We just don't know. So a lot of, you know, our conversation is driven by yeah. a lack of data. Yeah, and then we, we would need to make some kind of a calculus. I don't know how we would make this, but the number of people who are wrong and basically could never have, an, they got their genitals mutilated, they can never have an orgasm, they can never have children. They can, so we'd need to, we would need that versus the number of people, if this is an actual, has a biological basis or whatever, we'd need to kind of weigh those. I guess maybe that would be an argument for a better filter to filter out who is quote unquote legitimately trans. But for that, you'd need a test so then, all right, it's comp. It's you know, it's complicated. So then yeah. there's uh, again, they may be just gay. Most of them may just Most be of gay. Them, over fifty percent. And that if you just yeah. do the watchful waiting, the medical model of watchful waiting, they just turn out to be gay, and that's perfectly fine. It's totally acceptable now, and so on. Maybe some of it is you know these uh, guys who are autogynophilia, right? Who are aroused right. sexually by feeling like they're female or dressing. I'm reading a book about that now. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll anyway, so but uh, I mean, we know that that is not a acceptable hypothesis for those who identify as trans, because it sounds like it's a just a kind of a perverted sexual kink. Yeah. And I don't feel like what I'm experiencing is a sexual kink. Yeah. You know, so there's been pushback. Like Michael Bailey, that was Michael Bailey's hypothesis. He's a gay guy. You know, he thinks these are just gay guys that like dressing up because they get off on it. They're not really women, and but but the trans women, who, these are guys, male to female trans, who identify as women now, they're going, hey, you know, they don't like that hypothesis. Mm. You're just telling me I'm a so, sort of a sex kink, and it's more than that. Okay, so that's one of it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, again, uh, just we just don't know that much. Yeah. I want to I switch to talking about your last book, Conspiracy. Is there any conspiracy or something you formally considered a conspiracy but learn more about it and now no longer consider Oh yeah, lots. I mean, most of the stuff that came out that I mentioned, COINTELPRO, FBI's program to spy on U.S. citizens. Uh, I mean, the stuff with Martin Luther King Jr. that we now know, that our own government that was signed off by Robert F. Kennedy, the original, you know, when he was uh, Attorney General under his brother, Jack. You know, signed off on spying on him, recording his sex in hotel rooms to blackmail him. Our government did that. Robert F. Kennedy did that, not Junior, the senior. And, you know, and, and the FBI, they, you know, they all signed off on this. They, they got, you know, court orders and so on. 
against our own citizens. Mm. Okay, there's a lot of that that goes. So on. you've you've changed your mind, and the reason you I didn't think our government was that corrupt. Yeah, <laughs> this is the deep state. The deep state. Come on, that's a bunch of bullshit. Actually, there is, there is something to that. Yeah. Not not in the QAnon sense, but that you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes on that not only do you and I not know about, most of Congress doesn't know what they're doing. Yeah, you know, bouncing to something else on that, Vivek Ramaswamy is running for president as a Republican. Yeah. We'll, we'll bracket the likelihood of that. His campaign has gained a lot of steam lately. I'm going to be on his show to talk about education. He wants to do away with the FBI, Literally wants to do it. He wants to just do a great cleansing. Department of Education gone. He wants to, I don't, I mean, I don't know enough about it, but it would seem, it would seem like we need some kind of federal bureau of inve to investigate yes. corrupt police departments. Yes, yes. To, I mean, it would yeah, seem yeah, like yeah. that we need something, but the problem is All these candidates, they always say stuff like that. You know, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. the other day was saying, you know, we have 800, 900 base, military bases around the world. You know, what do we have them there for? Just raises conflict, costs trillions of dollars. I'm going to close them all on day one when I'm president. It's like, no, you're not. <laughs> you're not. It's not going to happen. In the same way that Obama said, I'm going to close Gitmo when I get president. I remember that. He yeah, did. Yeah. yeah and, and, and I'm going to tell the, our NATO allies, we're going to have no more first use policy. No, no, we're going to end the no first use. No, sorry. I'm understating that. That we're going to implement no first use on nuclear weapons because at, at the moment we we can launch our weapons anytime we want. It doesn't have to be defensive. Yes, yeah. it could be preemptive if we want. And he said we're going to put an end to that. And the, the, our NATO ally said, "No, you're not. We have a treaty that says you have to have." Oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> no. Does your skepticism? I think I think that's what happens Do when you get into office. Yeah, yeah. Back to the deep state. I think they take them in the back room and they go, "Okay, here's what's actually going on in the world." Oh, crap. I, I didn't know that because I said I was going to. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry about that. You can't do that. Oh, right. And I think there's a lot of that. In a sense, I could see that as a good thing because we would need continuity and, and some kind of continuity in policy. And, yeah, and, yeah. Yeah. I mean, even for all the, the Trump derangement syndrome that people had and so on, most of what he did was pretty typical standard Republican stuff, you know, lowering taxes um you know juicing up the stock market and the economy deregulating business tightening up the border you know foreign policy decisions yeah that's, there was nothing crazy about that and there's only so much he could do uh and you know he tried to do even more but that didn't happen mm. so i think our the republic is pretty strong i'm reasonably confident 2024 is not going to be the end <laughs> as everybody's projecting do you have thoughts it's been in the news a lot lately and people have claim that it's a it's a conspiracy theory do you, do you have thoughts on the on the world economic forum oh <laughs> well i've never gone i've never been invited to davos <laughs> i suppose i'd go i got invited but i i don't think it's quite the secret cabal that it's been made out to be by the conspiracy theorists on the other hand i do think a lot of those things go on all the time i mean adam smith warned about this in the wealth of nations you know it's rare that uh, industry leaders get together at, before they start contriving to control prices. And yeah, things like yeah. That. That's what people do. So, you know, and, you know, Peterson is having something in London. I think it's in October. I got an invite to this arc. Have you, you heard about that? I've heard him talking uh, about something he wants to do. Alternative to that, to, yeah. to, to, to Davos World Economic Forum. Yeah. What's it going to be? Um, I don't I'm just so busy. I haven't really even, I, I don't know what it is. Um, I should look at it. I don't know if I'm going to go. Um, but Reed and I had such a good time in London, mm. uh, highly motivated. And, I'm, and I really believe um, it's, from my limited understanding, it's a program for an alternative future. Uh, the European conservative has a piece about it. But again, I don't know that much about it. Hard to say. I mean, uh, you know, somebody had to come up with the idea of the European Union uh, or the United Nations. I mean, these things have to start somewhere. So yeah. you know, maybe this is the one. Most of those things don't go anywhere. Uh, because they're not practical enough. You know, I mean, it, 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 most of us live in the world of ideas and ideologies. Yeah. And, you know, we read books and give, go to TED Talks and things like that. But most of the world runs on the kind of boots on the ground. You know, is this going to fix the potholes out of my street? Yeah. Uh, what you're talking about? Because that's what I care about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So, so I talked to Glenn Lowry yesterday. And I really like Glenn. I've always liked Glenn. Glenn is a no-nonsense evidence-based analytical thinker. And I asked him, he told me about his kids and his grandchildren, 
and I asked him what he thinks his grandchildren should know. What do you think your sons, can I mention his name on air? Yeah, Vincent, sure, yeah. yeah. What, what do you think Vincent's, what would you like to tell Vincent's children? Like what, <laughs> what should they know? Uh, the, the truth matters and how we get there is the hard part in which we have to talk to other people to find out what's true. That's probably the most important thing in terms of you know, intellectual epistemology. Other than that, you know, be empathetic and, uh, you know, just uh, understand other people differ from you on all kinds of ways and try not to be judgmental. Mm. I mean, really, that's kind of what it comes down to. What, what's next? Are you going to write another book? Or what you yeah, gonna... so the next book is going to be the follow-up to Conspiracy. is uh, It's called Truth, what it is, how we determine it, and why it matters. Uh, it's kind of the, the kind of the general theory version of what I presented in here, uh, my, my tripartite theory of why people believe. God, that's a theories. great title. <laughs> yeah, truth. Yeah. Well, because that's the problem now. I mean, that's the issue. So not just, you know, I'll go through all the Bayesian reasoning, signal detection theory and rationality and logic and critical thinking and all this stuff that I do, but apply it to lots of things, not just science and religion, but morality, how do we determine moral values, facts and values, that kind of stuff, but art, literature, myths, you know, I've really been thinking a lot about myths, Jordan Peterson, jo Joseph Campbell, yeah. kind of, you know, truth in myths, a different kind of truth, a mythical truth or a psychological truth, you know, these, these are not empirical, scientific kind of claims that you can test, it's a different kind of thing. So I, I try to listen to Jordan, um, sometimes he's out too far out there from, from my kind of thinking, but uh, I try to find so what's he after here with this story about the dragon or whatever, you know, so, oh, he's after this core thing here about human nature, something, something like that. So what, one thing I've been thinking about is I'm old enough now to have seen what you've seen in that different ideologies come, different ideologies go. Do you think there's any kind of a, like a universal prophylactic against this to protect our institutions? Like, is there something, because I see, for example, what's happened to the ACLU and the SPLC, and now I'm even on, fortunately I'm not listed as, you know, on, in the main, but I met, mentioned in the SPLC, and because well, James Lindsay, they really, they really hate James Lindsay. They have a pathological hatred of Jim. Do you think there's a kind of, I don't know, like, I, the only way I can think of say it is a universal prophylactic to prevent our institutions from being hijacked by alternative ideologies or epistemologies so that they stay true and discharge their mission statement? I have the answer here in Please. this uh, chapter, uh, How to Rebuild Truth. Oh, I think I turned pretty close to it. Um, this was based a lot on um, Jonathan Rausch's book, The Constitution of Knowledge. I love that. He was, he's so, also with UATX. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. he outlines uh, what needs to be done, not just in science, but journalism, um, you know, the criminal justice system and so on. Uh, fallibilism, you know, the ethos that any of us might be wrong. Objectivity, a commitment to the proposition that there is a reality and we can know it through reason and empiricism disconfirmation, reality-based individuals who understand that their claims will and must be challenged. You know, accountability, reality-based community members who recognize that being wrong is undesirable, but it is inevitable. You know, pluralism, the acceptance of and insistence on viewpoint diversity, right? That's a good diversity. We like diversity, but how about viewpoint diversity, right? Civility, right? Be nice. Develop and fellow elaborate protocols which encourage people to argue calmly and depersonalize their rhetoric, like stuff in your book on how to have impossible conversation. Professionalism. You know, there's experts, credentials. They do count for something. You know, you, you got the union card. You know what the, what the rules are of our community. And then finally, number eight, no bullshitting. <laughs> it's my favorite. <laughs> a complete rejection of behaving without any sincere regard for truth. Right. So bullshit is not just lying. Bullshit is, I don't care. The liar cares about what the truth is. Yeah, He's yeah. got to get around it. Yeah. The bullshitter doesn't care. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So I think if we have built into our institutions, journalism, science, criminal justice, and so on, some kind of system like that where there's checks and balances, you know, this is why it's good to have editors and fact checkers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, somebody says, "Hey, I, you know, I found this story. Okay, do you have a second source, a third source?" Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, awesome. Okay. You've All right. Been very generous with your time. Where can people find? 
Skeptic.com is for the magazine. Uh, MichaelShermer.com for my books and articles and stuff. And t Twitter? And Twitter at Michael Shermer. Yeah. Awesome. And I, I want to thank you. Um, first of all, I want to say I really value your friendship and our relationship. And I want to thank you. You were pivotal in my intellectual life. And your books oh, have been... Gosh. Yeah, it's really true. Your Thank books you. have been North Stars for me, and I'm incredibly grateful, not only for our personal relationship, but for the work you do. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for your work. Awesome. <laughs>